so I can do selfies the whole time. Um, and then I'm going to come back to this. Hey, so I had a basket. Where's that basket? Um, we're going to receive. Here, throw it this way. Shoot, 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 shoot. Okay. I want to take a break from the Matthew series just for today. And I want to talk about something that has been on my heart, but God really stirred it up. And I, I was like, okay, we need, to, we need to have this conversation. And it's not bad, don't get scared. But we, we need to have this conversation. And it's a conversation around uh, spiritual apathy. Does anyone know that word, apathy? If you don't know that word, let's look it up real quick. Someone, someone help find me a definition for apathy. Nope, not quite. Mm. Hey, Maya, Maya has a good definition. Would you read it nice and loud? Read them both. Is this mic on? Please, so we all can hear. The first, is it on? Yep. Oh, the lack of feeling or emotion and lack of interest or concern. Mm. Okay. <laughs> a lack of feeling or emotion of what or concern? Of interest or concern. Wow. Spiritual apathy. I'm talking about in our walk with Jesus, you ever feel apathetic? You ever feel just lukewarm? Like maybe once you were on fire, but now it's just lukewarm. There's a lack of interest, a lack of curiosity, a lack of desire. There's just a contentment with the current even though you know deep down you were made for more? You know that God is infinite, but you feel like you only experience this much of him? You feel that? Yeah, I have a lot in my life as well. And I just had a sense that some other people might be feeling that right now. So we're being real. How many would say, that's where I feel, I feel like I'm at right now, by a show of hands? Please put them high. Just, just lead the way in that. Put them high. More than half of the room, it's all but just a few of us. Okay, so that's where we're at. Spiritual apathy. It's like the embers of our heart. We, we talk about fanning the flame of our faith. And there's times where maybe we've lived on purpose and on passion and on mission and there's nothing that could divert us from this life oriented to Christ and we found ourselves immersed in the scripture and in God's word and, and praying with him and f to him fervently and, and telling other people about the goodness of God and, and just believing and expecting and anticipating and over time you're not even sure when it happened but over time that just seemed to cool down and over time you find yourself like if you looked at charcoal when it's burning hot and now it's just a bunch of ash barely holding on. Maybe you'd say, that's where I am right now. That's what I want to talk about. Because <laughs> that's not what you were made for. And I don't want to see any of you live life in that place. Because you don't have to. You don't have to. You're invited into more. And I want to remind us, because we're going to take charge of this today. I want to remind us that this world, like everything in this world, is actively seeking to make you less like Christ, to train you and form you and mold you into anything but his image. Why? Because there is real evil, there is a real Satan who seeks only to steal, kill, devour, destroy. You, that which God loves, and everything of God's kingdom. And so in this life, 
almost everything in our world is actively trying to lead you away from him. You notice that just, you just, even if you do life passively, it just seems like your habits take you away from him. The only way we seem to grow with Christ is the moments where we're actively pursuing him. And the moment you take your foot off the gas pedal, it's like progress just fades away. You felt that? So the world is actively pursuing to take you away from God, to keep you away from your identity, to keep you from his goodness, his will, his plan for your life. Because in that, evil is threatened, and through the Spirit, evil will be destroyed, and it's fighting against that reality, and it's fighting against you. So this is the message for today. There is a spiritual war taking place over your soul. There is a spiritual war taking place over your soul. There is a battle against evil forces, darkness, dominions, principalities, all that is waging war against God. And as we live life in this world, one of two things are happening. We are, we are either being reformed into the image of God and made more like him, or we're being deformed and made to look less like the image of God. I have a slide for you. I want this visual up for you. We are being deformed in this direction or reformed in this one. We've talked about this a little bit before. So this isn't totally new. But think about this. God is actively in the process of making us like him, shaping our character and our heart and our nature to be like him. And evil is actively doing everything to move us in the opposite direction. And there's no such thing as being in the middle. There's no such thing as just sitting back and saying, I'm just going to coast right here. No, because if you're coasting, you're moving at the pace of our culture, and our culture is not being led by God, so it's being led this way. So coasting is coasting this way. Reforming, deforming. What do you want? I want to be reformed. I want to be remade into the image of God. I want to be realigned with his, ident with his identity and with the identity that God has made me for. So next slide. There's a couple different things that happen here. Depending on which way you go, you, you are experiencing more darkness in your life or more of God's light. You are walking closer and closer to death or stepping more and more into eternal life. You are either falling into a desperate pit of despair or rising into a life of hope. You are either being led in the ways of Satan or walking in the life of Jesus. There is no in-between because there's a spiritual war for your soul. And the really good news for you guys is that Jesus has already done everything necessary to secure victory for you. If you're a Christian today, if you're a follower of Jesus today, you know this is true, that Jesus lived a life perfect, blameless, sinless, when you couldn't, so that you could, be, you could enter into that life. And he conquered death on the cross and bore the penalty of the sin that we were meant to bear so that we could experience the fullness and the reality of God's love and none of the consequences. And then he ascends to heaven where right now he rules and reigns and is guiding us and leading us towards life. And that's the promise that we have. That is the life that we enter into. But even though God has secured the victory for you, you still have to walk in it. You still have to walk in victory. It is still necessary for you to determine the allegiance of your heart. Am I going to be aligned with the ways of this world? Or am I going to align my heart and my desires and my affections and my purpose and the will and the ways of God? You have to decide. You have to choose. You still have to believe in your heart. Jesus died for your sins. You have to believe there is even anything that you need to be saved from. And so often I see we live as though we don't need to be saved from these things. We walk 
in patterns of brokenness. We walk in habits of wickedness. We know in our hearts that this isn't right or it isn't good, but deep down, if I'm honest, sometimes I just align my desires in the opposite direction of God. We all do. If we're real and look in the mirror, we can see this in our lives every day. And what I want to do is I want to implore you, I want to, I want to plead with you to believe that God is who he says he is. I want, to, I want to plead with you that you would believe that this is true, that there is a spiritual war being waged over your soul and that you have to choose to walk in the victory and choose to align your heart this way. I think a lot about <laughs> the uh, Hebrew people Slaves in Egypt for around 400 years, and God does some miraculous things, and he, he actually sets them free from their captives, and they begin to, to exit and to leave Egypt, and they get to this Red Sea, this barrier that couldn't be crossed. It kind of represents our sin and our separation from God, and God miraculously intervenes, and he parts that sea. He makes a way through the water, but when I look at the scripture, the story says that as the people uh, walked through the water, there were walls of water on both sides of them. And imagine this. This is a sea. What would that wall of water on either side have looked like? And I have to imagine it would have been daunting and terrifying. I'm imagining in gusts of wind, but it's probably because I've watched some cool Bible movies. And I'm picturing these walls of water continually rushing up and the wind blowing through. And there's something in that moment where I realize that <laughs> that's terrifying. Because if I enter into this, and I, if I step into this journey, and I go to cross on this dry land with walls of water on either side of me, I have to believe that God is who he says he is, and that he's truly making a way, because fear is going to tell me that water is going to come crashing down on me at any moment. And if you turn back, what the Hebrew people would have seen was the army of the Egyptians coming their direction. And to walk through that sea... They would have had to believe that there was something to be saved from and there was a God who was going to be faithful to provide a way through. And that on the other side of that water, there's life. There is freedom. There's the life God made them for. It's kind of like this image. We can keep it up for the rest of the time. Egypt was slavery and death. Through the water was freedom and life. But they still had to have the faith to walk through. They had to have the faith to keep going. They had to have the belief that there was actually something to turn and flee from. And then they get on the other side, and it's like the rest of the story of the Bible through the Old Testament is this tension with Israel wrestling between the new life that they are invited into and this desire in their flesh to go back. We read it in the scripture, they say, if we went back, at least there we had meat, at least there we had food, at least there we had a place to stay, and they're complaining about what God is doing, but it's like they don't realize that if they were to go back to Egypt, all there is there is death, all there is if they return is slavery, all there is is captivity, but forward ahead is the promise of eternal life. The promise of a promised land flowing with milk and honey, resources, provision, all that they needed would be provided by God if they would just keep walking with him. And the tension and the wrestle is, will we trust God and what he says here, or are we going to turn back? I feel like that's kind of our story. Each and every day, we have to decide, are we going to continue to press forward towards life, or are we going to go back? But I ask you, What's back there for you, except for what you felt you needed to run from in the first place? What could be back there for you? Thank you for affirming that there is nothing there. So I'm going to ask you two of the most important questions you could probably ask in your life. Number one, do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe in Jesus? I mean, it's a historical fact that he was alive and he lived. But second question, do you believe that he's God? Do you believe that Jesus is God? At some point, you have to answer that question. And if he's not, 
then why follow him? Might as well go any other way because, goodness gracious, life with Jesus is hard. But if in your heart you say, yeah, yeah, I believe he's God, then why would you turn any other direction? If he is a God who is good, if he's a God of promise and provision and life and freedom and hope and light, why would you turn any other direction? And I find myself like the Israelites so often feeling like I'm just going to coast or it's getting too hard so I let off the gas. Or I find myself thinking about the things I miss that I used to have and I start wanting to go back. But what is there there? Jesus at one point asks his disciples, he, he says some things about who he is in the kingdom and what it looks like to, to live life. He says, you have to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. And like, this is your life. He's saying, I have to be your sustenance. I have to be your everything, your all. And he's saying some difficult things, and the crowds begin to turn away. They turn back. They're like, yeah, no, this guy, I'm, I'm not sure. Like, he does some miracles, and he does some cool stuff, and he does some healing. But this, these are some hard words to listen to. And they turn away, and Jesus turns to his disciples. They're like the last ones left. And he says, do you want to leave too? Do you want to leave too? And they say something quite interesting. They say, <laughs> where would we go? If we left you, Jesus, where would we go? You are the one with the words of life. You are the life. But a disciple at some point says, no matter, even though it's going to be hard, even though you say some hard things, Jesus, you're the one with the words of life. So I follow you. Wherever we go, I'm following you. So I want to ask you, what do you want? What do you want in life? Do you want life? Do you want freedom? Do you want joy? Do you want hope? Do you want meaning and purpose? Do you want identity that's rooted in something that can last? And do you believe that Jesus can provide it? Do you? This is not as easy of a question as it sounds like it is, because this question will guide the rest of your life. This isn't just one question. This is your eternal path. If you don't believe that Jesus can provide, you're not going to lean into him. But if you really do, you won't turn anywhere else. How could you? Where would I go? If Jesus is God, then he's the one who knows the way. If Jesus is God, then his word is truth. If Jesus is God, then it doesn't matter if I disagree or if I, if I want to argue with him on some of the things he challenges me with. and It doesn't matter what's going on. His word is truth. So if you're wrestling with depression, suicidal thoughts, anxiety, you're, you're wrestling with homosexual tendencies, anger, bitterness, unforgiveness, if you find yourself hiding behind a mask and just trying to fake out the world right now, if you're struggling with pornography, lust, or pursuing sensual desires, or in regard to money, treasure, careers, success, relationships, and singleness. It doesn't matter what the topic is. If Jesus is God, then there is one way. There is one truth. There is one life. There is one answer. There is one door. There is only one way. And we can wrestle with it, but we know there's only one way. And it has to guide everything in our lives. Jesus says, I am the door. I am the way. I am the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. He says there's a really, really wide road, and a lot of people are walking on it. And there's a really, really big gate, and a lot of people are walking through it, and it leads to death. But there's this really narrow road, and there's this really, really small gate. And only a few people find it. 
And only a few people walk through that gate. And only a few people experience eternal life. He says, I'm that gate. Jesus is that gate. And right now, our world is missing it. They're walking the wide road. (laughs) And sometimes I find myself jumping onto it too. But Jesus is the way. God says to most of this world, when they get on the other side of this life, he's going to say, I never knew you. I never knew you. There's going to be a lot of people who think that they should be saved, that they think they should go to heaven. They think they lived good enough, they were righteous enough, but that was never the standard in the first place. The standard was surrender to him. The standard was receiving his gift, and he's going to say, I never knew you. I have to ask you, if your life, think about this, if your life was to end right now and you were in the presence of your creator, would he be able to say, I know you? Or would he say, I never knew you? I never knew you. You never worshiped. You never prayed. You never listened when I guided you. You never trusted me. You never Sabbath just for the sake of being in my presence. We never, we never did your life together. Can you be assured that God, God would say he knows us? God, I put myself in a position. I'm walking with you. I do life with you. I'm oriented around you and you alone in such a way that he would say, yeah, I know you. <laughs> of course I know you. We spend every day together. We do life together. You ask me for guidance. All of your questions, all of your answers, you say, Lord, let my words be your words. Let the truth I speak be your truth. Let my character and my life be guided by what you say and, and by what you write in your scriptures. Is that you? Is it? Is that a tough question? Do you like the answer you see? You don't have to tell me. You don't see the answer? Cool. We'll work through it tonight. kind of crazy that I might say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. Oh yeah, I'm living for Jesus. And yet in my heart of hearts be like, I don't know if Jesus would say he knows me because I don't spend time with him. I'm sorry, friends, but I care about you way too much to let that be your story. And I don't think it's what you desire. I don't think it's what you want. I don't think you want in this life to live a life of spiritual apathy. I don't want, think you want to live in passivity. I don't think you want to experience the things on this side of the list. I think you want life. I think you want to know God, right? You want to pursue him. You want there to be a flame fan in your heart for God. It's what we were made for. Jesus has won the victory for you, but you still got to walk in it. I want to reiterate the gospel to you. God created this earth and everything in it and on it and around it and the stars, the heavens we see, and he made it good. He made it so good. When I look into the stars, I can't help but say, wow, your creation is so amazing. When I look at a mountainscape, I can't help but be in awe. When I look at like biology and like how things grow through life, like from, from an egg to like a fully fledged creature, and that that works like all the time, I'm in awe. The God who created all of that, he made it good. He was pleased with it. And then he made something completely distinct and unique. He made humanity. He made Adam. It's just the Hebrew for humanity. And he said it was very good. In fact, it was unlike anything else he had created because it was made in his image with his likeness and his character and his attributes. And then humanity decided not to just submit to God to say, yeah, we'll, we'll do what you say. We'll live as you have us live. Humanity decided 
through deception from who? From Satan. To not be submitted to the words of God, but to become the judge of God's words. And to say, is it really good? Is he really trustworthy? Is what he says really true? And they walked away. And there was sin that entered creation in that moment. And from that point, our hearts, the human race, we have been tarnished and marked by this toxicity and this poison. Our desires have not been good. Our pursuits have not been right. We are selfish. We are greedy. We are prideful. We are arrogant. We are hostile. In our hearts, that's true. I know because I've hated people before. And that's not God's nature. And in that, the penalty of sin, the penalty of falling short of God's will, of God's design, is what? It's death. Why? Because there's there's life and there's death. And God is so perfect that nothing imperfect can exist in his presence. His perfection, his glory would just destroy it. That's how holy he is. How unlike anything else he is. And then there's us, right? They go, wow, we can't even exist in relationship with God. And God sees the sin and he sees the brokenness. And instead of getting angry at humanity, what he does is he says, I love you so much and I want eternity with you. When that I am going to fix this. He doesn't ask us to make it right. He doesn't ask us to fix it. He says, I'm going to, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to make it right. And the rest of the story of the Bible is him doing that salvific work, that saving work for humanity, making a way, humanity turning away. The story of Israel is our story. Like if you just read the Old Testament, every time I'm like, yeah, that's me. I turn away. I continue to turn back. And yet he provides a way. He promises a Savior. And through Jesus, Jesus enters this world. God in flesh lives a perfect, sinless life. He's called the second Adam, the new humanity, humanity as humanity was always meant to be. And he both lives the life we couldn't live and shows us the way, what life is meant to be like. And then he goes to the cross and he dies. The penalty is paid. The death that we deserve, Jesus takes upon himself for every sin from the beginning of creation to every sin the rest of humanity will ever commit. He says, I'm going to pay the price. And it took a perfect human to do it. And he did it. Why? So, So he could receive anything? No, he already had everything. So that you could be saved. So that you could be reunited with God forever. So that you could be made back into the human you were always meant to be. To experience the life you were always made for. And to spend eternity with God forever. And he rises again. And he ascends to heaven, and he right now rules over all of creation. And there is a second coming, a day when Jesus will come back. This time it was in grace to show us this life, to invite us to receive this gift. But there is a day coming where he will come back, and he will judge all evil. He will right all wrongs. He will cast Satan and all of his evil forces, and he will send them to the depths of hell for eternity. And all those who receive the gift of life that he gives will experience Everything on this list and more for the rest of all eternity in perfect paradise and communion with our creator and each other forever. And that is the hope we have. So as we struggle and we wrestle and we suffer through things, we know that that day is coming. We know that that life is on its way. We know that that's what we are living towards. And that is the good news of the gospel. And we need to choose the allegiance of our heart. Will we align ourselves with the kingdom of God and his will and his way? Will you? And I just want to say in this moment, remind us, hell was not made for people. Hell was made for evil. And the unfortunate circumstance is that for whatever reason, we doubt the goodness of God and we align ourselves with evil and we force ourselves to be destined to the very same place but it wasn't made for you. It wasn't made for people. So I just want to do something real quick, and then we're going to get practical. There were a lot of hands in this room. I don't know everyone's story. 
But I just want to say, if you've never received Jesus in your life, if you've never received the gift of eternal life that he offers, if you've never prayed a prayer, if you've never invited him in, if you've never surrendered your life, not one time, and you want to today, because we're real and we're authentic, I just want to invite you to raise your hand and say, I want to receive Jesus into my life, and I want to step into this life. I want to receive this gift. I want freedom from my sin. And the thing is, I know a lot of you here are Christians. So if you're on the other side and you would say, I prayed the prayer before, but I've turned. I've walked away. I've grown cold. I've been living in spiritual apathy. Or in some segment of your heart right now, you would say, there's a chance that Jesus would say, I never knew you. And you want... You want, to, you want to come back to him. You're always invited back. I want you to raise your hand right now. And just keep it high. Awesome. Me too. Every day I stray. So let's close our eyes. You can put your hands down. I just want to pray right now. I want to say, God, we know. We know who you are. Many of us have experienced your goodness. We've lived lives on purpose and on mission with you. But we have grown apathetic. We have grown cold. We have turned away. We have turned back like Israel wanted to back towards Egypt. We have turned from our source of life. Right now, God, those who raise their hand, we're saying we're coming back. You secured victory for us. Lord, we are choosing to live in it. We're choosing to live for you. This isn't an emotional decision. This isn't fueled by some dramatic music playing in the background or some desperate appeal or fear. This is our personal decision. Say, God, from this day forward, we're living for you. We're living for what we're made for. We're chasing after you. We're clinging to you. We're not turning to the right or to the left. But God, I pray that you would fan the flame of our faith, that you would build us up, that you would encourage each person who raised their hand, that you would encourage us as a body to live the right direction, to live towards life, to submit ourselves to you, whether it's hard or difficult or or whether you say trying things. God, you are our, our life. You are where we find our identity, nowhere else. And we are either being deformed or reformed into your image. And we choose today not to try to stand in the middle, but to come back to you and say, we will be reformed. We will commit our hearts. We will walk with you. You will know us. Because we will be knocking at your door. We will be in communion and communication with you. We will be immersed in your scriptures. This is who we are, and this is what will define our life. Amen? Amen. Amen means I agree. It means so be it. It means, <laughs> yep. <laughs> but it's like more spiritual. <laughs> spiritual apathy, it's so real. But there is a spiritual war being waged for your soul. And I don't want to see anyone trying to ride the line or stand in the middle. So what I want to do is I just want to talk about ways that we can fan the flame of our faith. I want to give you tools on how to train your heart to love God and to live for his kingdom. So this is the part where I would take notes. Because this is the part that's practical. This is your day-to-day. This is your everyday If you are a citizen of the kingdom, then these things will mark your life. These things will be your habits. They will be your activity because you are are implementing divine tools, divine things that God has given us to allow us to be people of the kingdom and to be reformed each and every day into his image and to fight and to resist the the war of this world that is seeking to pull you in the opposite direction. This is how you're going to do it. God gave us this. Number one. Bible intake. Bible intake. I'm talking reading Scripture, memorizing Scripture, and meditating on Scripture. What are these three things? And shout it out. If you want me to repeat, I will do this. Reading Scripture is simply opening our Bible and being in God's Word. 
Because every, voices are speaking to you every single day. You're hearing a lot about what's important, whether it's through advertisements or political campaigns or just the, 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 the desires of our culture, the things that are promoted, what we seem to think is most valu- valuable. We are being taught in a certain direction. We are being taught to have our eyes on one way, and we are being taught to take our eyes off the kingdom of God. When you read God's word and immerse yourself in his scripture, you are immersing yourself in the image of the kingdom. You are allowing yourself to see who God is, what the kingdom of God is like, and who the people of his spirit are called to be by immersing yourself in scripture. It's okay if you feel like when you read it, sometimes you're not getting much out of it. You're like, I don't even know if I understand. I was just talking to someone in my cohort uh, for school, and they were saying, man, when I, when I was early on in my faith, they were saying, I was reading the scripture, and it didn't even make sense to me, but I'm just like, wow, this is awesome. I don't even know what I'm reading, but this is so, so great. That doesn't even make sense other than the fact that Holy Spirit was opening their eyes to see. And they didn't understand it, but he was still getting the kingdom into their hearts and into their soul and into their being. And if this book remains closed, then God's primary way of communicating to you, you have shut the door on. We've got to read scripture every day. And I'm not saying you've got to read 12 chapters a day. You could read one verse and just meditate on it. It's, that's chewing on it. That's processing through it. Saying, what does this mean? Working through the words, doing it one word at a time, processing through it. What does this mean for me? And it's allowing yourself to make sure that you don't leave even that one verse. You don't walk away. You don't close your Bible without somehow being changed, without somehow having something that you're going to apply that day. So when you see in the scripture that it says uh, that we are to live lives of integrity, or you see generosity, or you see compassion, what you're going to do is you're going to say, this is going to be my challenge today. I'm going to be a person of the kingdom, and I'm going to live a generous life today, or I'm going to be integritous today. And so as you walk out of your home in the morning and you go throughout your life, that is at your, the forefront. That is at the front of your mind. And as there are opportunities and challenges and things that are seeking to pull you away, you're saying, no, that would be disintegritous. I'm a person of integrity. I'm a person of the kingdom. I'm going to make the kingdom choice. When you see an opportunity to be generous, you are going to say, I'm not going to be stingy. That's the way of death. I'm going to be generous. This is the way of life. This is who God has made me to be. And you know what happens is as you read scripture and you meditate on it and you apply it is it begins to reform you. Spiritual growth happens. You can go home at the end of the day and you can say, whoa, I had an opportunity to lie and I didn't take it. God is renewing my heart. I'm being made like him. Thank you, God, for what you did today. may seem small, but integrity is no small thing. That is spiritual fruit. But you could read the 12 chapters, and you could put your Bible away and just go, okay, and walk away, and nothing happened. Why? You didn't apply it. You didn't think about it, right? You didn't walk away and say, what is, how am I going to be different because of what I just read? That's a great question to put in your notes. How am I going to be different because of what I just read? Memorizing scripture, it should be in your heart and your mind. I pointed to the wrong one. <laughs> it should be in your heart. We should be able to recite and recall sc- scripture in the moment because the word of God needs to be written upon us or I'm going to challenge and say, if the word of God isn't written on you but you have more songs and lyrics and things memorized, then you are more trained in the ways of the world than you are in the ways of Christ. Memorize the word of God. Memorize the words of life. Get it in your heart. Let it become who you are that it would just flow from you. Let it define us. Bible intake must be non-negotiable. I don't care if you feel like, oh, I just don't desire to read the Bible. That's not true. Yes, you do. You are a person of the Spirit. You want nothing more than to know God. You want nothing more than his scripture and his word and the words of life and the words of truth and the words of hope. You want nothing more to encounter your identity. You want nothing more than to experience his kingdom. You want nothing more than to walk in the way of truth, right? Right? And so it's not true that you don't desire the Bible. Why would you ever say that? I'm saying something a mentor of mine challenged me with. I was like, yeah, why would I ever say I don't want to read the Bible? I'm training myself to speak the words of Satan over my life. I long for God's word. I long for scripture. I I, I delight in his truth. I delight in his words. They are trustworthy. They are the words of life. Bible intake. Do it in the morning. One verse. Read it for one minute. Meditate for five. Try and memorize it. 
Take it with you. Make that the goal of the day. I'm going to memorize this one scripture verse on my YouVersion app or whatever, whatever, wherever you find your scripture. In your Bible, I'm going to memorize this one verse today. Or I'm going to memorize uh, this section or this chapter. I wanted to memorize Psalm 19, and so I just worked through it line by line until I had it. And I was worth the work. <laughs> it was worth the work. Bible intake. Number two, prayer and communion with God. Prayer, all of us should make it an intentional part of our day, all throughout the day, to check in with God, to ask for the guidance of his spirit, and to listen, right? That's how he leads us. Every day, that should be part of our lives. I'm just going to ask you real quick, because we let off with saying we're going to be authentic, right? Right? How often, how, how often do you read your Bible throughout the week? How, how many times do you find yourself opening this and sitting down? One time a week? If it's less than that, would you raise your hand? There's no judgment here, but I just want to set you free from the shame. Set yourself free from the shame, yeah. Less than once a week. Okay, two to three times a week? Two to three times? We got a few. More than three times? Just a few of us, more than three. Okay, every day, once every day would be seven. And that's just once. Like if he's our source, why would we do so much of life unplugged? In the morning, read scripture in the morning. Read scripture in the evening. Let it be the last thing that washes over your mind before you go to bed. Let those be the thoughts that go into your dreams. Wake up in the morning, and before you pull out your phone, before you check Instagram, before you check Snapchat, before you continue that, that streak, open the scripture. Start your day with him so that the rest of your day is on a trajectory with God. Pray, pray, prayer. How many of you pray less than once a week? You find yourself talking to God less than once a week. Thank you, thank you for being honest. There's no shame here because our desire is to grow together, Right? There's no shame. I spent a lot of my early Christian life not praying at all. Two to three times a week. Five times a week. Ten times a week. Okay. Yeah, if it's more, awesome. It's great. You're on a good track, on a good trajectory. Thank you guys for being vulnerable. I'm not judging you. I care about you more than anything. I want the best for you. That's why we're having this conversation. Praying to God is communion with God. If you're praying to God every day, I don't think there's any way he's going to say, I never knew you. He spent time with you every single day. Right? It's that simple. But now I'm not even just talking about like praying your needs. Like, God, I need this today. God, help me with this today. I'm so grateful that we can come to him with those needs. But worship him in prayer. Give him your affection and your love. It doesn't, I don't care if you don't feel like it. Yes, you do, because <laughs> you were made for it. Tell yourself you do. Speak that truth and give him your affections. If you find your affections are somewhere else, you can change your affections in a moment by saying, God, thank you that you are my hope, that you are my life, that you are my strength. I adore you. I love you, God. You are all I want. You are all I want to chase after. You are the one I'm running to. You are the one I'm clinging to. Nothing else can provide my life. Nothing else can provide satisfaction. Nothing else can give me what I need, but you are my source. You are my life. You are the only one worthy of worship, God, and I know that is true, and you can't pray those words without it beginning to create a desire in your heart for him. It can't help but increase the temperature of your spiritual soul. It can't help but raise that temperature and increase that affection and cause you to want to live for him. Tell your soul what is true. Let your emotions catch up. Here's a model for prayer, really easy, that runs us through a couple things that I think are really helpful. It's called ACTS. A-C-T-S, kind of like the book of Acts. A stands for adoration. 
Ooh, not enough people writing this down. This is your model for prayer. If you feel like you don't pray enough, that's okay. Hey, someone give him a pen and someone give him someone give him this right here. Boom, you have Yes, I love it. Thank you, sir. A stands for adoration. Adoration is our praise. It's, it's connected to our affection. It's our heart. Give God your adoration. C stands for confession. So much of our spiritual freedom is blocked by the fact that we don't confess our sins. Many of us are not even aware of the fact that we have sins or that we've sinned that day. All of us have sinned and fallen short. I want to be aware of them. I say, God, forgive me for the sins I'm aware of, and I list them, and I say, forgive me for the sins I'm not aware of. Would you increase my awareness? Would you open my eyes to see my own sinfulness, that I could bring it before you and confess it and ask for forgiveness? And every time we do so, we are surrendering the old way, and we're stepping into the new, and we are being freed from the sin and the guilt and the shame associated with it. That's confession. T stands for thanksgiving. Ooh, spend some time just thanking God. If you don't feel grateful or you can't find joy or you just don't feel happy, start thanking God for all of the goodness in your life because every good and perfect gift comes from him. Thank you, God, that I have a home. Thank you, God, that I'm surrounded by friends. Thank you that you provide for me even when I'm struggling with school. Thank you, God, that even though I feel like I'm in a dark place, I know that I'm never alone. Thank him. Just thank him. Find everything to thank him for. It's many things as you can thank him for because that will take your mind off of the darkness and the death and put it back on life. We're training our souls. We're training our affections. S stands for supplication. S-U-P-P-L. That's where I'll go. That's where I'll go. I don't want to mess up. <laughs> supplication. This is where we bring our needs before God. But I want you to notice that supplication is after all these other things. How many of us just simply come to God for needs? We almost use him as a vending machine to provide for the things we need in the day, and so we're not seeking relationship with him so much as we're just seeking what he can give us. These, keeping it in this order, in, in some way this order, is, is great. Sometimes, I know someone who said they, do, they, do, uh, they pray through cats, because they're like, I just think I need to confess sometimes before I even start praising God. I do that too. I do that too sometimes. So if you want to pray cats, pray cats. If you want to pray acts, pray acts. But here's a tool for you. If you've never prayed or you're struggling to find a way to do it or you just, you're caught in a loop or you're praying for the same things and you don't even know if anything is happening, Use this model. Here's a tool for you. Okay. This isn't for comparison's sake, but I want to walk you through one of my days a little bit. When I wake up in the morning, first thing I do is I don't grab my phone. Unless I actually, unless I'm like, absolutely need to check the time because I'm like, I may have overslept. I don't, I don't touch my phone. I keep it there. And I pull out my Bible Right here, I have a one-year Bible. Sometimes I use this. This one-year Bible is designed in such a way that you just read the certain amount of scripture that they give you for the day. So this is Old Testament. And then here is some New Testament. And then uh, there's Psalms and, a, and some Proverbs for the day. And so every single day, you're reading out of the Old Testament and out of the New Testament. You're reading out of the Psalms and you're reading out of the Proverbs. And through that, you will work through the whole Bible once in a year. And I think it's the Psalms twice. Proverbs twice. Probably Proverbs twice. It's shorter. If you don't know what to read, don't know where to go, just get, get this in your mind and in your heart. Get the kingdom in there. This is a model. If you could, didn't feel like you could do the whole thing, just do the New Testament piece for the time being. But you can find this on version. You can just look up a one-year Bible. You can do that. You can, I sometimes just work through a book, but uh, sometimes I just find a little bit of Scripture. If I'm in a rush, I'm still going to start my day with God. I'm going to immerse myself in Scripture. I'm, I'm going to read. I'm going to ask myself, God, what does this mean for me today? How am I going to apply this today? I give myself the challenge for the day. And then uh, I have this little book right here. This is newer for me, but I've used other tools like this. This this is a collection of prayers that are about 200 years old. They're liturgical prayers. So, uh, so instead of praying my own prayers, I pray something that's written here. And all of these are like, they're so 
good. They feed my soul. They use the thee, thous, and thys. Uh, but they feed my soul because they're so rich in theology and they're steeped in history. And so it gets me praying outside of myself. And I do that in my morning before I've ever even gone anywhere. As I get ready for the day, I get into my car. And as soon as I get into my car and I turn the ignition, I begin to pray in the Spirit. And I, and I begin to align myself with God, and I, and I slow my mind. I'm not even thinking about work that yet. I'm just praying with him on my drive, and I say, God, help me to be a citizen of the kingdom today. Help me to live for your purposes. Give me eyes to see. Help me to pay attention to what you are up to and how you are moving in this world. And help me to participate with you in the lives of others today. Help me to live outside of myself and not live for my will, but to see yours take place on this earth. And that's how I pray in my car every day on my way to work. So before I even get to work, I have already committed myself to being a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And then as I go through my day, I'm also praying throughout my day at different times and asking God for guidance and wisdom and, and just strength and just thanking him as opportunities come up. And then during my lunch break, I will always take time to simply pray to God, to just spend some time with him, to be in the quiet and to just pray. Eat my food, pray. There's almost never music playing during my lunch. Just pray. Uh, and then by the end of the day, when I come home, uh, my day ends the same way. I begin to brush my teeth, and that's my cue to kind of like zero in for the night. And I'm brushing my teeth, I'm winding down, I start thinking about my day, and then I go into my room, and I've got a little desk next to my bed, and uh, I start to pray with God, and I start to just listen and think about what took place for the day. And then I pull out my five-year journal, which is a journal where you write basically just a snippet uh, every single day through the course of a year. So there's like May 18th, May 19th, May 20th, May 21st, and I write something God did today, something he taught me, some way he shaped me, some way I fell short, but I want to grow, something worth celebrating, something that happened in someone else's life that I just want to record, but it's always about what God is doing, his activity in my life, so I never end my day unaware of how God did his work in my life that day. And I have been doing this for three years, as you can see, and I don't miss a day. Because this is part of my daily routine as I go to bed. And I do that, and it causes me to just be so grateful to God. And then I start to pray. And I lay down, and I'm praying to God, and I'm thanking him for those things. And I begin to lift up various needs of people in my life. Uh, other, you guys, students, our youth leaders, people in our church and in our community. And I just lift up those needs. And I thank him, and I rest in his presence, and I fall asleep in prayer. That's my Monday. And so my Monday, I spend more time with God than many of you are in your entire week. And as I'm going through greater spiritual challenges lately, I'm finding that this doesn't feel like enough. Because as life presses in harder and harder, my roots and my faith in God must grow deeper and deeper. I have to. When things get hard, I never say, oh, I just don't have time to pray. I go, no, I don't have any time not to. I am dependent on God. I have to grow deeper roots. As I begin to get stressed and overwhelmed and anxiety begins to creep in, I'm, I'm running to these disciplines and I'm, I'm rooting myself in them every single day. And I know that God is saying to me that I can be closer to him. Number three, spiritual community. Spiritual community is a, a space where we are sharpening one another. Be at church. Be in your squad. Spiritual community is not just friendships. you got enough of them elsewhere. But spiritual community and fellowship is where spiritual sharpening is taking place. That we are nudging each other and, and, and keeping each other accountable and asking one another about our Bible reading and what God is teaching us this week. And we're holding ourselves to biblical character like each other. Like when you notice your friend is, is, is starting to stray and miss the mark, we're lovingly stepping in because we know that God has placed us there to do so. And we're inviting friends to do the same with us and we're being vulnerable and real and authentic and in spiritual community this is the space where we are being trained to be followers of Jesus together is anything like this happening any other space in your life there's no way no one's helping you grow in the image of Christ this intentionally so if it's up to me I'm putting myself in spiritual community as many times through the week as I can I am, I am at church, and I am in my small group, and I am doing Bible study, and I'm, and I'm engaging with people. Even at a distance, there's people that I call and I talk to, and I'm accountable to weekly, monthly, these things. We're doing spiritual community together because spiritual maturity cannot happen alone. Number four, worship. 
Worship God, not because you feel like it, but because he's the only one worthy of it. Worship God for his goodness, for his glory, for his sovereignty, his control over everything, for his wisdom and his power. Worship him for his grace with you, that as imperfect as you are, he still loves you perfectly and is gracious with you. And come to God and just worship him. Just worship him. Worship him for who he is. We don't always have to worship uh, out of a place of emotion. Here's the thing about God that's so cool. He already knows how much you love him. So worship isn't so much about, God, I'm going to show you how much I love you. It's just, God, I'm going to enter into the space to be aware of your presence, and I'm going to submit to the work of the Holy Spirit in my soul. That when we enter into worship, it's not primarily about you singing. It's about God wanting to download things into your heart and your life, and the Holy Spirit actively wanting to reform you. And we enter into that space. When you worship, through, you can do it through music and song, but we do it through all of these things as well. When we worship, we are opening ourselves up to the work of the Spirit in our lives. Worship. All of this is regardless of whether you feel like it or not, because we're training our affections. We're training ourselves to love it. Most of you hate running when sports season starts. And by the end, you feel good when you're running. You feel in shape. You, you're like, I could run the whole soccer field. Maybe not. Um, but it becomes something that you don't abhor so much. It's something that just becomes a part of you, and you start looking forward to practice, and you start looking forward to getting out there, right? This is training our affections. It's going to be hard at first, but it's worth the work. It's worth the work because we're stepping into life, and we're stepping out of apathy. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, boom. Number five, character commitment. I'm committing to the character of God. When I read about the character of people of the kingdom in scriptures, in the scripture, I'm holding myself to it. There is no room to say, eh, not today, not for me, or to joke about the fact that we're not doing it. Why would we joke about not being the citizens of the kingdom or the people that God made us to be? Why would we be content? Through character commitment, God will make you more like him. Commit to godly character. Does that make sense? Last one, perseverance. The scripture says, practice these things. Strive for these things. Toil in these things. That it actually takes some work. Persevere in these things. Persevere in it. If you don't see results, if you don't feel like you're seeing anything, keeping the pedal, uh, keeping the gas pedal down, don't lift it off. We've already talked about that, right? Don't lift off the pedal. Stay on it. Believe that God has truly ordained these processes as the means by which he renews you, the means by which he fans the flame of your faith, the way that he trains our hearts and our loves and our affections. Commit to it. Do it in community. Get together with some friends and say, hey, we're going to check in on each other every day or every week, and we're just going to say, how did you do? If you fell short, what got in the way? What's been an obstacle to you? And let's commit to this in perseverance, believing that fruitfulness is coming. Amen?